So um, yes, I'm an instructional technology coach and um, I work in rural Virginia at a relatively small school. For here it would be very big. We have about 870 students. And uh, my job is to inspire teachers and get them to use technology that we have or think about technology that we might want to purchase in the future based on what their needs and capabilities are um, and to get them to use everything as much as we possibly can in ways that really help students learn. So um, I try to get some inspiration from um, several people when I'm a little disappointed in how things are going. And um, Seymour Papert is one of these people that I just go to and I just read what he wrote sometimes just to make myself feel better that we've been doing this and we are getting closer to making this a reality that um, we give kids things to do, that it is not the teachers doing things for the kids to consume. Because when we make things as teachers, we're wasting the opportunity to let the kids learn by making whatever it is. Um, because we already got our degrees, we already have our jobs, and now it's the kids' turn. So if we don't let the kids make stuff, then they're never going to learn. So part of what I have to do is not make things for my teachers just like they should not make things for their students. Um, so another person that I really admire and I get a lot of inspiration from is Mitch Resnick who always talks about making things with students but making things that are meaningful and he says research has shown that many of our best learning experiences come when we are engaged in designing and creating things especially things that are either meaningful to us or to others around us. Like finger paint, blocks, and beads, computers can also be used as a material for making things. And not just by children, but by everyone. Indeed, the computer is the most extraordinary, extraordinary construction material ever invented. And computers can be seen as a universal construction material, greatly expanding what people can create and what they can learn in the process. So my next quote, I have, actually have audio um, because it's a quote that has been misquoted and taken out of context and used in all sorts of different places. So um, here's Steve Jobs. I remember uh, reading an article when I was about 12 years old, I think it might have been in Scientific American, where they measured the efficiency of locomotion for all these species on planet Earth. Uh, how many kilocalories did they expend to get from point A to point B? And the condor one uh, came in at the top of the list, uh, surpassed everything else. And humans came in about a third of the way down the list, which was not such a great showing for the crown of creation. And, uh, but somebody there had the imagination to test the efficiency of a human riding a bicycle. Human riding a bicycle blew away the condor, all the way off the top of the list. And it, it made a really big impression on me that we humans are tool builders and that we can fashion tools that amplify these inherent abilities that we have to spectacular magnitudes. And so for me, a computer has always been a bicycle of the mind. So a computer is a bicycle of the mind. It lets us go well beyond where we could go if we were just walking or running or even rolling down a hill ourselves. Um, but I'm pretty sure this is not what Steve Jobs meant when he wanted us to use a bicycle. So one of the things I always talk about to my teachers and to my administrators at school is you cannot have technology just sitting around so you can point to it and say, look, we have it. Isn't this awesome? Because that doesn't make a difference for anyone. So we have to use technology in meaningful ways. So how many of you have one of these at home? Do you know someone who has one of these at home? Well, oh, come on, yeah. So what happens if you get one of these in your home? Do you automatically get more fit? Hmm? Right, so even if you use it every day, <laughs> it doesn't help you if you're using it in a way that is not meaningful. So you have to think, okay, just because the kids are all staring at their screens and typing doesn't mean they're getting anything out of it. So how about this one? How many of you have one of these or something similar? It's my favorite thing in my kitchen, love it. So um, does this make you a better cook? What if you normally cook really bad stuff? And then you have this and all you do is make bad food faster. So putting technology in your kitchen doesn't make you a better cook. Putting technology in your classroom doesn't make you a better teacher unless you change everything else. Your ingredients, your recipes, your procedures, how clean you keep your kitchen, 
um, how often you serve the food, because if you just cook it and pile it up, it's all going to go bad. Um, so you have to change everything, not just put new technology in and keep going on with business as usual. So this is something, have, has anybody heard of this, SAMR? So SAMR sometimes gets a really bad reputation, but it's, I, I find, a very useful framework for thinking about how we use technology in the classroom. So the problem is that when people don't understand it, they come up with all these ideas that make it into a really bad thing. So um, how many of you have seen this? This is one of those crazy things that when people don't understand SAMR, they will give you some sort of uh, metaphor for how to think about it. But if you look at this, this is coffee, this is coffee, this is coffee, this is coffee. We changed the presentation, but Basically, it's still a cup of coffee with a little sprinkled on top. But we're still going to drink it. We're still going to consume it. The same barista is going to make it. Nothing changes. So this is really not a very useful metaphor. This one is also another popular metaphor for explaining SAMR, which is a little bit better, because you start with no technology on the beach, then you're moving, and you're all the way down here. So you're going through substitution, augmentation, modification, each time you can get a little bit deeper into what you're learning. But unless I can see into that submarine and see a group of students doing experiments, I don't know that they're really doing anything because they might just be still consuming, looking out the window at what's out there. So they have to be doing something. You can't judge by the appearance of, oh, they're using technology, they're learning more. You have to look at what they're doing. Always look at what students are doing. Never at what teachers are doing. Always think about what students are doing. This is another great example, and um, it drives me crazy. Can anybody figure out what any of this is? Does this make sense to anyone? So this is something that supposedly explained the SAMR model in terms of apps that you have available to use. Um, but all it shows you is a bunch of apps. Some of them don't even exist. Some of them have nothing to do with education, and then a bunch of verbs. But if you look at this, are you improving your teaching in any way? So let's go back to this and actually figure out what it really means and how it can really help us think about technology. Can you see the pattern here? Do you guys remember this? Does anybody remember these? You have to look through the image, not at the image. When you see the pattern, raise your hands. So I think of your, everybody's looking at this going, huh, I don't know. SAMR to me is a lot like this. When you just see the four words and nobody explains it to you, it really doesn't have a meaning. Just like this, it just looks like a lot of colors on a screen. But if you actually look at it and unfocus your eyes a little bit, you're going to see a 3D pattern. And when you, once you see it, you can't not see it. Has anybody seen it? But if one of you were to say, yeah, yeah, I see it, how many of you would go, yeah, I see it, uh-huh, not really, but yeah. So that's what happens with SAMR. People don't really get it, but when they hear a lot of people talking about it, they go, yeah, 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 maybe, but everybody's afraid to ask. So let's talk about this, really talk about what it means and how it can help you think about technology. Oh, no, I've made a mistake here. Okay. Let's pretend it's beautiful. Okay, so substitution. I just added one thing at the last minute. and So um, this is substitution. You're going from having a stylus at one end, and I'm sure, and this is all technology. All of it is technology. Just because it doesn't have a battery and doesn't plug in doesn't mean it's not technology. To the people who were making little marks on clay tablets, that stylus was very advanced technology. And when ballpoint pens came out, there was this big uproar. Oh, no, we can't allow ballpoint pens because people have to know how to use a quill and ink and this and that. So it's all technology. But if you're writing with a stylus or you're writing in Google Apps, if you have not changed anything else, if you're a bad writer at this end, you're still a bad writer at that end, just like your mixer. If you're making bad food without the mixer and you don't change anything, you're going to still be making bad food with the mixer. But the important thing is that we're gaining something. It's a little bit more efficient. And 
students are learning something that they're going to have to use. So they're learning a tool, but the tool is not the content. It's just the tool. So substitution is just taking one tool and changing it for another tool without changing anything else. Um, so we used to have to, you, to take notes because before there were books for everybody and the internet, only one person had the information and everybody else just had to copy it down. So teaching focused on transmitting information from one person to everybody else who was in the room. And this is still often the case. There's a teacher talking, like I'm up here talking, and then there are students out there taking notes. So you can take notes on a tablet very, very slowly, or you can type your notes into your computer, but you're still doing the same thing. You haven't really changed anything, and just because kids are writing it down doesn't mean they're really learning it. You have to move away from focusing on the tool and change everything that you do in your classroom. So substitution is administrative and it is teacher-centered and students don't learn anything but the tool. Um, so when we go to augmentation, the most common example that people, this is a very important question that you should ask when you are um, thinking about this, this framework. You have to ask questions about what's happening in the classroom. So what are you changing? And at every step you have to ask, what are you changing? So does this change, if, if you use another tool, are you changing um, what kids are doing? And so people often cite this example. You can be doing Google Docs, but if you put it in Drive and you share, the kids can work together with it moving out of their desks. So they don't have to move out of their desks, but are they really doing anything different? The question is, are they doing anything different? Are they learning anything new that they wouldn't have learned if they had moved their chairs and sat next to each other rather than working at different sides of the room in the same document? So students are using things that make it easier for the teacher for the most part, but they themselves are not gaining anything new and the activity has not changed. So when we look at this, there's a line in the middle. And the important thing about this line is that at the bottom, it's the changes are teacher-centered. And above the line, the changes are student-centered. The original activity starts to fade away into the horizon and you start coming up with completely new things for students to do. So in modification, you're going to ask, how was the original task modified? If you're still doing the same thing, but you're using a different tool, even if you think you're modifying your lesson, you're just substituting your lesson. I mean, substituting one technology for another. Um, does the change depend on the technology? Because if you could have done it on paper, you might as well stick to paper because it's a lot cheaper. And then, does, how does this change my overall instructional design? Meaning, the activities that the students are doing, are they meaningful and are they helping them learn? Or is it just something fancy that you do after the test because you're done with the test and you, you can do something fun? If that's your attitude towards technology, you might as well not do it, right? So, thinking about modification and thinking about um, tools that we use. Do you guys use these things to make um, displays in the classroom, the dreaded trifold cardboard. So it used to be that we used to draw everything and then PowerPoint came about and we started doing slides, right? So from cardboard displays to PowerPoint, it's augmentation. So you're going from, because they can make changes and they can present in the classroom and they can use more different media than they would just using paper. But then we went to Google Slides and people are like, oh, awesome, now they're using Google Slides. If you go from PowerPoint to Google Slides, you're still at the same level. You're just substituting PowerPoint for Google Slides. And then you use this one, which gives you motion sickness. Do you guys know Prezi? <laughs> you don't want motion sickness. So then augmentation is iMovie, it's making a video augmentation. Yes, no. Maybe? So if you're making a movie and all the kids are doing for the movie is presenting their slides, let's look at the questions. How was the original task modified? They're still presenting. They're still presenting the same thing. Does the technology change what they do? Not really if they're just presenting to the camera. So the kids don't really learn anything unless you're, they're making a movie that is completely different than what they would have presented live. So it's important to think not just about what tool you're using, but what the end result is. 
If the students are still presenting to the camera with some picture in the background, it's not any different than presenting to an audience. So they might as well stick to speaking in front of the audience because then they can take questions and it's an important skill to have, speaking in front of an audience. So the important thing is to think about the instructional design. How does the end result change and what skills are the kids acquiring and how's the technology making it possible? So with redefinition, I'm gonna go somewhere that is a little weird. Um, with redefinition, you have to ask, what is the new task? Will any portion of the original task be retained? Meaning, are you still doing the same old thing but just adding a few things on top? Like your cup of coffee, you just put cream on top. Or are you, going to some, are you making something that's completely different? Um, is the new task made possible by the technology? And again, how do the students learn with this new technology? So if we talk about this again, let's go back to this example. Students used to do everything by hand. But then we got printers. And then you could print the titles and just draw the pictures and make your nice little poster. And then you could print out of Google in color. And you could make these great displays. But now we can print in 3D. How many of you have a 3D printer in your school? How many would, would love a 3D printer in your school? Ah, yes. So is 3D printing redefinition? Yes, no, why not? It depends on what you're doing. So if you're just downloading files from Thingiverse and printing them out, is it any different than downloading images from Google and printing them out? You're not getting anywhere that's different. You're not making anything that's different. And the kids are only learning the technology. They're not learning how to create. They're learning how to use the printer to produce stuff. So think about what you do with great technology when you get it. You could do amazing stuff, or you could just do the same old thing. Download, print, and not make any changes. So this is a quote from a friend. I, we had a conversation about 3D printing, and he said, if you have bought a 3D printer, that's great. If you're using it to print downloaded files or to print anything you could get by the dozen at a fraction of the price, this activity may be fun and interesting on the surface, but is, it is anti-educational. You are teaching students to waste energy, to waste filament, to contribute to pollution, and to take the easy way out by impressing the people who don't really know much about technology. You walk around with a 3D printed object and people are blown away because they think you made it. And then they go to Thingverse and there's 20 versions of the same thing. That's not very good. On the other hand, 3D printing can be a wonderful thing. Imagine making things that don't exist yet. Imagine, ki imagine kids making their own Lego bricks to fit their own designs or printing a modified part for a machine that allows it to do something slightly better or more quietly. That's the real promise of 3D printing. This downloaded stuff, that's a terrible waste. That's not redefinition. So think about, sometimes you hear in the news, oh, in this school they designed a prosthetic arm and they printed it. And it is such a rare thing that kids do something that amazing with technology that it makes the news. It should be the everyday thing. We should not be blinded by the coolness factor. And we should be working towards having kids do stuff that really is meaningful, that is something that they have designed themselves, that tells us who they are and what they value. So these are very important questions to think about when I talk to, to teachers about using technology in the classroom. And if you see, it's all about the students. What are the students making and how is it meaningful? How is it helping them learn something that they could not learn before? And how is it making us all a better society? So back to this. Understand that this is a great way to think about this about technology in the classroom if you use it properly so that you do not have this phenomenon. Don't be stuck here. Make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you can communicate this. Make sure you can bring people along in this journey to make technology meaningful in teaching and learning. Thank you.